A Virginia man charged in connection to his wife's murder now says he wants a speedy trial, but experts say that may just be a tactic to throw a curveball at the prosecution, who, by the way, still haven't charged the suspect with murder. We'll break down the case both sides are expected to bring with expert attorneys and hear from those who spoke to the defendant in the days after his wife's disappearance. The entire time, he's, he, he did not have eye contact. He was looking somewhere else and trying to cut me off when I tried to talk. This is the case of missing mother, 28-year-old Mamta Koffel Bott, and her husband, who's now accused of concealing her body. This story has a few twists and turns, so let's start our timeline at the beginning. Mamta Koffel Bott is a registered nurse who works at the University of Virginia Health Prince William Medical Center. That's in Manassas, Virginia, about 30 minutes outside of D.C. Mamta lived in Manassas Park with her daughter and husband, Naresh Bhatt. More on him in a second. The last day anyone for sure saw Mamta was July 28th. That same day, she posted a TikTok video of her baby crawling up the stairs. But after that, her social media went dark. Mamta was due back at the hospital for work the next week, but she never showed. So on August 1st, her co-workers called police, asking for a wellness check. On August 2nd, police visited Mamta's home, and that's where her husband spoke with law enforcement for the first time. When Naresh spoke with police, he told them Mamta was either in New York or Texas visiting relatives, but investigators later discovered Mamta doesn't have any relatives in either state. It took until August 5th for Naresh to report his wife missing, and at that point, he told investigators he last saw her on July 31st, days after anyone else reported seeing her. During this time frame, Mamta's case was upped from missing person to involuntary or critical missing person status. On August 14th, Naresh spoke with local media, claiming his wife had gone missing three times before this. He added that he missed her and was waiting for her safe return home. The next day, Manassas Park Police called on the public for help, asking anyone with more information to report it. It was August 21st when the home Mamta shared with Naresh was searched by police. We've since learned they executed at least 10 search warrants and by that point had conducted hundreds of interviews. The following day on August 22nd, Naresh was escorted from the home in handcuffs. At that point, Mamta's family was granted an emergency visa to leave Nepal and come to the United States to get custody of her daughter. Naresh was arraigned the next day on charges of prohibition against concealment of a body. It was then that investigators revealed some of the evidence collected all pointing to Naresh as the case's suspect. According to court documents, Naresh was seen at Walmart on July 30th. At that time, he bought a pack of three knives. But when the search warrant was later executed at his home, investigators only found one. Detectives allege that Naresh used them to murder his wife on the same day, July 30th, inside their home. The next day, on July 31st, Naresh was back at Walmart, and this time he bought cleaning supplies. Unlike two-thirds of those knives, these cleaning supplies were recovered when police executed those search warrants. Also inside the home, investigators found blood pooling in the bedroom and bathroom, almost as if someone had dragged a body through those rooms. Experts say based on the amount of blood found inside the home, the victim wouldn't have been able to survive. A body has not been recovered in the case, but Mamta is presumed dead. Even so, her husband still has not been charged with murder, and at a court appearance on September 5th, Naresh waived his right to a grand jury and was granted a speedy trial. To understand that move by the defense, I turned to criminal defense attorney, Casea Early. That the defense in this case is asking for a speedy trial and it's done strategically, and here's why. Typically, when defense attorneys ask for a speedy trial in such a complex case like this, they're banking on the fact that the prosecutors aren't ready, that they're scrambling to get their state witnesses together. They're hoping that as the clock is ticking, that they're running out of time to basically build a good case against the defense. So I think this will be the only possible reason because you're dealing with a missing body. So you're gonna to have to get experts. You're gonna to have to get all of the law enforcement officers to pretty much testify that, you know, based on the evidence collected, there's a strong probability or strong likelihood that the person that's missing is most likely dead. So it's definitely strategic. 
So you said it's strategic and that the prosecution won't have a lot of time to collect their witnesses, evidence, get their ducks in a row, so to speak. But would the same be said about the defense? Because they too have to prepare their witnesses and get their evidence collected and kind of form their case. It can and can't be. And here's why. Because when you file a demand for speedy, you're basically swearing. And when you're swearing to the court or advising the court under oath that I have a bona fide reason that I'm filing this demand for speedy, I am ready, I am prepared for trial. You're, as an officer of the court, we don't file those type of speedies, even if our client wants a speedy trial unless we're ready because we're the ones that have to try the case. There's been many times that my client wanted a speedy trial because he's in custody, he's being held no bond, he wants this process moved swiftly. And then I have to tell him, I cannot stand behind this motion. You are being represented by my office. And unless I am truly ready, then I'm going to put you in a worse position. So allow me to thoroughly investigate the case. So I think in this case, the defense has a real reason, a true reason to file a demand for speed because I really believe that they are ready. But in the court of public opinion, there's a lot to be said about Naresh, including from the Manassas Park community, like Bina Kod Kalama. But what's different about this case is that her husband wasn't very cooperative, let's say, or outspoken. Was that initially fishy to you? It has been, yes, because think about it, like in your family, in my family, if we don't come home 10, 15 minutes, you know, in, until 10, 15 minutes late, you know, our families worry about it, right? If if our dog, something happens to our dog, you know, we're worried about it, to, to forget about human, right? So we're, we're so much involved, we're, we're so much worried about and love and take care of whoever we will live with belongings and everything. This is your wife missing from a few days and your face is calm. Come on now. And you have to tell us something because you're the one who said that you saw her last time. You slept with her maybe recently or, you know, you, you, your, your baby was with her. So you know the best. Nobody does. So, and you feel, you seem very calm. And you, I know you were, you were saying the words like, oh, I, you know, I don't know where she went. I want to, you know, you know, search her, come back home and everything. But you're not showing the symptoms of panicking. You're not showing the symptoms of worrisome. So it's definitely there is something that you know more. Bina says after Mamta's disappearance, she spoke with Naresh at his home. So I did go to his house and I asked, what do you need? And we are here to help you. We're going to pour whatever we can to you and baby if there's any need. Um, except for money part, I never asked about, I never talked about the financial you know, help because we wanted to do logistic, uh, like, you know, baby's care and everything. So, but he said he does not need anything. And, but I... Um, kind of convince him or you know ask him if he wants to do the daycare and he said okay but he never used that um but entire time he never looked at me entire time he's he, he did not have eye contact he was looking somewhere else and try to cut me off when i try to talk and i'm like you know what i am not a psychiatric doctor i'm a nurse i do have basic knowledge right that when you have this, you know, this horrible things happening in your life, you do not act like this. You act something different. And I don't see that from my, my point of view. Were you surprised then as you're following this case, you know that she's missing, seeing the developments. Were you surprised then that Naresh was eventually arrested? We feel, as a whole community, we feel kind of hopeless right now. Because I know the police department cannot reveal everything, whatever they're doing. I'm really, um, I'm assured. And then I'm so, I trust police department. They're doing, you know, night and day and night. They're working so hard to get everything possible. They, they, they're saying that the, this case is strong. The Commonwealth is saying this case is strong. But I do not know how strong it is to prove him guilty. Because we all know, even the police department, even the Commonwealth know he is guilty. Right. But only the thing, the problem is how to prove him guilty for the capital murder. Right. We want that if he did that. But we are hopeless a little bit that, you know, oh, my God, what if, you know, they, they can never find the evidence. They can never. Find. And, you know, I know, like I has researched a little bit that you do not have to have 
behind the body for him to get convicted. But, you know, like you need to find evidence that he did it, right? So I am just praying. We're all praying. We're, we're all so ready to give tips and everything. Just this week, Manassas Park Police announced they recently received a helpful tip in Monta's case. They didn't specify what the tip was, but encouraged others to come forward with any info. We're so fearless. We call police. I have called, I don't know how many times. When I see something, I just directly call police and give the tip to them. So people have been doing that. And we're really, really hoping that whoever has more information to link this case to get stronger and get more evidence, to write evidence, please they would step out and because they also have life, they also have family, they also have children. So they have to think about that. What if, what if Mamta was her own, their own sister, own daughter, own mother, own whoever, right? So what would you do if that was your family member? How far you go, you would go, how, how much crazy you are, you know, you're going to get right to get everything just done and get the person, whoever did it, right? Whoever did it behind the bar uh, forever, right? Meanwhile, the case against Naresh is still full speed ahead. With that in mind, it sounds like the case would then take place, the trial rather, would take place in 2025, early 2025, and we're already in the fall, so just a couple of months away from now. If it does go to trial in that time frame, what could we expect to see? The defense coming in with their case kind of airtight? What about the prosecution? What are your thoughts? Well, here in Florida, you either have two different types of speedies. You actually either have a natural speedy, which is 175 days for a felony case, or you have a demand for speedy, which is about 50 days from the time that you file your demand for speedy. So either way, you're looking at a lot of challenges, and I believe uh, for the prosecution, because you have the holidays coming up, right? So the courts are closed. Some of the dates are blocked off. You have major... Uh, holidays coming up for state witnesses who typically take their leave at the end of the year. So it really depends on when that deadline is for the demand for speedy, because if the case is not tried, then the case gets thrown out forever and the state can't come back and file it because it's double jeopardy in this case. So I believe that most of the challenges would be on the state, the prosecutor, depending on where the, the case is at. Um, to prepare this case, get their witnesses lined up, and actually get a court date before the court. What's interesting about this case is that he is charged with concealing a body, but he has not been charged with murder. I know you mentioned double jeopardy. Obviously, he couldn't face these exact same charges for concealing the body, but could he later then face the charge of murder? Well, if the state believe that they have sufficient evidence and that they can prove beyond a reasonable doubt, it's in the best likelihood for them to charge him with murder, amend the information, if they have that. There's a possibility that if they try him under the same facts and circumstances under concealing a body and he's acquitted and then they have more evidence of murder, there'd be a strong likelihood that they cannot charge him with that because he was already charged under the same facts and circumstances. So typically... If the state does not believe they have sufficient evidence to move forward, they won't move forward on that charge. But concealing a body, you know, you're going to face multiple years in prison. So they may just go for the low hanging fruit as opposed to something that's not really attainable. Are those reasons why the prosecution hasn't brought these charges of murder? I mean, they could potentially based on the amount of blood loss, but maybe the evidence isn't quite airtight enough. What are you thinking? I think that's why. I think that although there's circumstantial evidence that may point or lead the jury to believe that he had some involvement in the murder, I don't believe that they have enough to go forward, which is why they're going with the missing person. But, you know, the testimony from the expert, the amount of blood, like you said, was lost. They're going to have to persuade the jury that that amount of blood that she lost could not have sustained her body to, to the point where she's possibly alive. And I think that that's what the jury is banking on. Maybe they'll have their own expert to testify, yes, yeah, she lost a lot of blood, but there is a possibility that she may be alive. And if there's a possibility that she may be alive, there is your reasonable doubt, reasonable doubt, not guilty. Or you may get a hung jury. You may have this one holdout jury that says, well, wait a minute. I know that this expert testified that that wasn't a lot of blood or that was too much blood loss that she could possibly be dead. But... This expert, the defense expert, testified that, you know, although that was a lot of blood, it could have been mixed with other, but like, there it has to be sufficient evidence that the state has to bring forth to kind of secure that conviction. 
So it really depends on if the state in this case is even listing witnesses. We don't know at this time. So there may not be a murder charge, but there's still a good amount of evidence for Naresh's coming trial. One of the reasons we're talking about the case and it made such headlines is because the husband spoke to local news media and basically said, I don't know where my wife is. Hey, we're waiting at home for you if you ever come home. Whatever, it was broadcast. And then eventually he's the one who's charged with concealing her body. Could that information that he put out on the news, let's say these clips from local media, could that then be used at his coming trial for concealing a body charge? Of course. And this is the information that prosecutors love to use. They like to get any statements that the defendant made prior to an arrest to show the jury the true character of that person. And the jury's going to watch all of those videos. And then when they realize, wait a minute, you gave a statement that you said you didn't know where your wife is, but at the same time, they eventually found blood, not just little droplets and specks of blood. They found a huge amount of blood that made the expert, um, his final opinion, that there's a great possibility that she's dead. They're gonna put two and two together. You know, the jury, very smart, and they take their job seriously. They take their oath very seriously. And I do believe with the overwhelming, overwhelming circumstantial evidence that there is going to lead to a conviction because you lied, it happened in your home, and you had some involvement. We have that, the news clips, then also the blood that was in the home, and also there's surveillance video of him purchasing cleaning products, and these same cleaning products are then discovered at the home right around the time that she went missing. Is this huge evidence for the prosecution? There we go again. This is the circumstantial evidence. So sometimes you have actual evidence, you know, you got, you got confessions, but then you have the circumstances that can be used. It's like a puzzle piece, right? You have different pieces of the puzzle and it's the state's job to put it together. So you have his false statements about not knowing where his wife is. You have the huge amount of blood found in his home. And then, oh, you have the cleaning product. And this is what we see time and time again. When there's a murder, they try to clean it up and they're not skilled, they're not knowledgeable, they're not career criminals. So they don't know that you can't just take normal cleaning products to clean up the blood. So with that, you have that consciousness of guilt, right? You're cleaning up blood in your home, yet in the same breath, you're saying you don't know where your wife is. So all of this evidence, again, will lead to a conviction because it appears based on what we see right now, it's overwhelming evidence. And I believe going back to the speedy, that this is why the defense wants a speedy trial. They're hoping that maybe the state doesn't secure an expert to testify or a forensic expert to testify to the amounts of blood. And if that clock runs against them, they have a better chance of getting an acquittal. The rush is due back in court on September 16th, and that's when a trial date is expected to be set. At the same time, Mamta's case is still under investigation, so anyone with more information is asked to contact the Manassas Park Police Department. Reporting for Law and Crime, I'm Sierra Gillespie.